All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ayla, and I am the Ocean Science Educator for Ocean First Institute. We are an ocean conservation nonprofit based here in Boulder, Colorado, and our mission is to protect the ocean through both research and education and to study animals so we can share how to better understand and protect the ocean. Today, it is such a privilege to have so many joining us from all over the world and the country to learn about the mysteries of Megalodon. Uh, the presentation will take about 20 minutes, and then we will take questions for the rest of the time for about 25 minutes. So during the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the Q&A box and the panelists will answer it at the end of the presentation. I am so excited today to welcome both our executive director here at Ocean First, Dr. Mickey and Gary Staub, an award-winning paleo artist who designed Megalodon for the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, Gary produces natural history and prehistoric life models for museums, publishing, and film. He has a degree in art biology and interned at the Smithsonian Institution and the British Museum of Natural History. His work and his eclectic studio demonstrate a flair and a passion for natural forms, both past and present. He has created sculptures for National Geographic Magazine, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, the American Museum of Natural History, the BBC, and the Discovery Channel, among many others. He has been the recipient of the prestigious John Lazenberg Paleo Art Award for Sculpture, presented by the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology four times. His work recreating the mummy of the Iceman can be seen on the PBS Nova special Iceman Reborn. And earlier this year, he and his team completed the installation of the 52 foot long prehistoric shark Megalodon for the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. I'm also very excited to introduce Dr. Mickey. She is the executive director of Ocean First Institute and one of the top shark experts in the world. Dr. Mickey holds a PhD in integrative biology and speaks, teaches, and conducts research all over the world, including in South America, Africa, Asia, and Australia. Her work has been widely covered by the BBC, National Geographic, and even Discovery Channel Shark Week. So I will now turn it over to these two impressive individuals to tell us about the mysteries of the Megalodon. Take it away, you both, thank you. All right, fantastic. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So um, again, uh, welcome. Thank you all for tuning in today to learn the mysteries of Megalodon. I am so excited to share this with you. And we're gonna start with Megalodon, here it is. Megalodon was the biggest shark that ever swam in our ocean. It was a fierce predator and it was absolutely breathtaking. Uh, so we are gonna learn a little bit more about the mysteries of Megalodon. So when did Megalodon live on our planet Earth? Well, it appeared around 23 million years ago and scientists have been studying the reasons for extinction. And it's believed that this shark went extinct around three million years ago. And we're still learning more about the reasons behind the extinction of this, of this mega shark. And so what's interesting is they lived all over the planet. So they had a circumglobal distribution. They were found all over the globe. And we find fossils of Megalodon all over the world. So who were their ancestors? Where did they come from? Well, we know that they are part of what's called family Ododon today. And that are the, they are called the mega tooth sharks. And you can see here, these are some of the ancestors of the Megalodon. And the first one that you see there on the bottom with the white tip on its dorsal fin is called Ototus obliquus. And that is one of the ancestors of, of Megalodon. And then there are a few other species called Carcaracles, uh, several different species that gave rise to the very large Megalodon. And you can see that some of these ancestors were nearly half the size of Megalodon. Megalodon grew so big because of its prey, it's believed. And so Megalodon was chasing ever increasingly larger sized whales and marine mammals. And so its size exploded uh, during its reign on planet Earth. And so how do we know how big and how do we really know that Megalodon existed on our planet? 
Well, we know that because of the fossil record. So what's interesting is that all sharks are made of cartilage. They're the cartilaginous fishes. They have skeletons just like you and I do, but their skeletons are comprised of cartilage. And that does not fossilize very well. So you can see in my hand right here, I have a fossil shark tooth. And that's really what gives us clues about what sharks sizes were, what their diet was comprised on. So we get a lot of information from a shark's tooth. And on the left hand side, you can see a totus oblicus tooth uh, teeth from Morocco in the rocks. And then on the right, you can see uh, a megalodon tooth, just like what I'm holding in my hand. Megalodon teeth got to be up to seven inches long. Uh, which is incredible. And this is a modern day great white shark tooth. So you can see the difference here in size. And again, the size of the teeth help us reconstruct how big these sharks got. So how big was Megalodon? That's the big question. Um, as you can see from this picture from the American Museum of Natural History, they got really big. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six men, grown men, sitting inside a reconstruction of what the Megalodon's jaw looked like. And so when we use all the scientists' information and mathematics to figure out how big Megalodon was based on its tooth size, it comes out to being almost 60 feet long. So you can imagine a modern day great white maximum size is around 22 feet. So 60 feet is a formidable shark, larger than a school bus, and it weighed upwards of perhaps 70 tons, which is truly incredible if you think about it. So that is one very big shark. The next question is, what did they eat? So Megalodon swam through the ocean and was able to eat pretty much whatever it wanted to. It preyed on marine reptiles, it preyed on marine mammals. And in this particular reconstruction um, by Julia Stonii, you can see that it's going after what's called a platybelion, which is an ancient looking uh, mammal that's swimming. And really Megalodon more than likely didn't go into shallow mangrove areas unless it was a female that was giving birth to their pups, their shark pups. Um, but this is a great reconstruction of what Megalodon was capable of. They also ate whales. Whales were a big part of their diet. And this whale is a baleen whale called Pisco balina. This was definitely on Megalodon's menu. How do we know? Well, we have found Pisco balina bones with Megalodon teeth inside of them. So we know that Pisco balina was on the menu of these great whites and they likely attacked with the element of surprise from below. Uh, and you can see here, this would be an incredible sight to see in real life if we could go back in time to see uh, a megalodon attacking a pisco balina with one huge bite. And this is not very different from what we see in modern day great whites when they do ambush predation on seals. Um, oftentimes they will come straight out of the water with their prey in their mouth. So it's not hard to imagine that megalodon would do similar. So then the question really is, why did megalodon go extinct? What happened? Well, there was an ice age uh, during the reign of the Megalodon and conditions on earth changed. The waters got cooler. Um, and what happened is a lot of their food, the whales started moving poleward towards the cooler water that had more krill or more uh, plankton in it. So we started to see a shift in Megalodon's diet towards the poles. And that really uh, would have been a big factor uh, for Megalodon. Megalodon probably could go into cooler waters to follow that prey, but it could have been a factor that limited um, their, their success. One of the other things that happened at the same time is we started to see some competitors coming in. Uh, and that competition was very difficult for Megalodon because we had the appearance of great whites who started to eat similar prey and they were very agile and very nimble and they were able to outcompete Megalodon in some ways, especially because great whites were smaller and Megalodons were larger. And so having a large body that required a lot of food may not have continued to be a benefit to Megalodon. 
they also had other competitors like this very scary raptorial sperm whale called Leviathan melvii. Look at the teeth on this animal. This was a fierce sperm whale. Um, it was hunting much more than modern day sperm whales that hunt squid. This animal was fierce. And if you look at the reconstruction of its teeth, you can see that it definitely had the ability to hunt large uh, other marine mammals. And that's exactly what it did. And again, it possibly outcompeted the very large megalodon, which had really quite heavy requirements for feeding because its body was so large, so much larger than the great white and even that raptorial sperm whale. So, you know, when we think about animals um, that are extinct, it, it it's just provokes our curiosity. It makes us want to know what they looked like. And really, when we have just the fossil record to work with, it's difficult and challenging to understand how to bring these things to life. Um, but this is exactly the fantastic challenge um, that Gary uh, works with. And I'm going to turn it over to Gary to tell us how he created the most scientifically accurate megalodon shark. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, so when scientists have a, a lot of information and they want to be able to present it to the public in a way that's exciting and delivers uh, the information in an accurate way, they, they collaborate with, with artists uh, a lot of the time. And I'm lucky enough to work with, with scientists and uh, develop exhibits for the general public that, uh, that kind of take that uh, that really broad uh, subject, very complex science, and then boil it down into something that, um, that you can really look at and enjoy uh, on exhibit. So my job was to create a life-size megalodon um, uh, for display in Washington, DC. And uh, it was a complicated job because of course, as Mickey said, we only have the teeth and we have some vertebrae. Um, the vertebrae are like our, um, uh, are like trees. In, f in fact, if you slice them, you can see incremental growth uh, in the in those. And the the job involves compiling that information, uh, teaming up with the scientists, and then and then starting to conceive of something that's going to be really exciting to look at. So it starts with the mechanical part of it. You have to figure out how. Uh, not only is the science does the science have to be correct, but you also have to try and figure out how you're actually going to be able to hang a thing that's as big as a Greyhound bus up in the space that's 83 feet tall, and it only had very specific uh, physical requirements to it. So it couldn't weigh over 2,500 pounds. That's just about. Um, that's just about 69 tons less than the uh, predicted live weight of the animal. So it had to be very light, it had to be fire resistant, and it had to go through a door that was just a little bit bigger than four feet wide. So it was made up in panels. The individual panels are fit together in the studio. Now I let it be known, I work with, uh, on this particular project, I have three employees, but for this project we had um, over eight people working on it and uh, and many people who actually volunteered time to come in and and, and uh, just take take part in this and it, it was complex because we did have their very uh, interesting and difficult shapes to manage through doors and they have to be physically strong but it has to aesthetically look right and we have to be able to do this on site it's like being able to uh, take a, a house apart and put it back together in a week so this is essentially the same same idea. Next. So this is a view inside of the Megalodon, and this is much larger than any studio. My, my this is my first studio apartment, essentially the size of it. It, it uh, I spent a lot of time. In fact, I cataloged the hours, and I spent a, about a month on the inside of this cast helping. Uh, figure out how to to piece the internal structure of it because it has a light steel structure um, but also to make sure that it, uh, it we could take it apart and put it back together easily and at one point I, I there's a little loft that you'll see on the top up there I actually fell asleep uh, inside of the megalodon while working on it we worked some very very long hours my team is just incredible so they I can't say enough about them they just they were just fabulous 
one of the things we don't know anything about, we have nothing in the fossil record that gives us an idea of what the color was of Megalodon. Now you can look, you can make inference based on environment. And uh, one of the things we wanted to try and get away from was just thinking that it's a scaled up great white shark. And so the, the quickest way to change people's view of that is to change color. Now, even anything beyond physical shape of the fins and the body. So we chose uh, a probably uh, a least, uh, probably not, it's not a, a super common to have a warm colored animal except for coastal species. But the idea that it, it took us visually and conceptually away from uh, what people would just see as a huge great white shark, I think was really appealing uh, to everyone. So that's why it has this warm color scheme. This is on site at the museum and we're uh, getting uh, the pieces together. Uh, that was just this small part. There's, there were uh, 21 panels that it came in. Uh, the teeth themselves, there's 138 exposed teeth that are individually cast and they're cast hollow so we can save weight uh, to uh, uh, of the overall model because that was a that was a very tr uh, tricky bit of business. Next slide. And this space uh, um, was is a finished museum space, so you have to be very aware of um, the people who are in that space, so you can't make fumes or anything like that. And and this is the way you can see the the green straps up there, how we rigged it, and then we used hoist to, to uh, uh, prepare to suspend it into the space. Now, one thing that can happen when you're working on, now these teeth are as sharp as they were in life. And it is entirely possible to put yourself in the hospital if you make a wrong move when you're working on the inside of these things. And it's been, I have a hole on top of a small scar on the top of my head uh, from a fossil crocodile that I worked on. And luckily, I have a few minor bruises from working on, on the megalodon, but no, uh, uh, no one went to the hospital, thank goodness. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things that you have to think about when you're doing that also is eye design. So when you're looking at, you can see on the interior mouth, we're looking at really small details and we're looking at how, um, how the teeth uh, are not all in a straight line. They 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 erupt at different times, and so and because when they fall out or or um, they rotate out or lost in prey items, that uh, there's they just sort of they they stair step their way out. And the, one of the other details that's really important because um, people are going to be really keyed in on the teeth, so we had to make sure that those are really really uh, detailed. Is also making eyes. So you just can't pop down to the corner store and buy yourself a megalodon eye. So uh, all of these eyes are designed um, in it. So I'd make all the eyes completely from scratch. So it involves a lathe where I'll turn the outside, outside uh, uh, surface of the eye and then create, sculpt the interior of the eye and then we pressure cast it in, paint it and pressure cast it to get an optically clear surface. And the eye design is really important as well. So if you see here, this is a generalized shark eye and, there, and shark eyes are as diverse and Mickey can talk to this, are in sharks and rays, all, any cartilaginous fish, they have really diverse uh, eye morphology, eye shape. And, uh, but this is one that I thought was striking in its appearance and, and thought it would lend, it, lend itself well to the rest of the color scheme. And what's cool too, Gary, is is that's just it. So sharks have mobile pupils, and so they can control the amount of light that's entering the eye. And there is some research that suggests that megalodon might be closely related to mako sharks. And what's fascinating about mako sharks is their eyes, they can superheat their eyes um, to above ambient water temperature. And this allows for the eye to work at its maximum capacity or its maximum speed of resolution, um, making sure that it is able to see very fast moving prey, like perhaps Pisco Um, So it's really fascinating to, you know, use 
species that are living today to try to understand the biology of an animal that lived um, five, 10 million years ago. It's really fascinating. And, and I wonder what made you decide to choose to have a vertical pupil versus another? Like what, what, was, uh, what, what were you thinking when you designed that beautiful eye? I'm just trying to figure out something that would be within in that group of lamniform sharks what what would be a common common eye if you get if you were to pick a shape because with the fossil there's no fossil evidence for eye shape because it's not that just doesn't preserve so we have to pick something that is believable um, if I were to pick one of the more radical designs, I think I, I would come under criticism for it. So I tried to pick something that was aesthetically interesting, but would be within um, a believable range. And what's also interesting is the positioning of the eyes. So the visual field of Megalodon is similar to that that we see in other uh, very fast moving predatory fish. Um, frontally positioned eyes really tell us this is a predator that has binocular overlaps, has excellent depth perception to judge distance um, under attack. So fascinating. One of the one of the other neat things is if we if we think about uh, bite force and they've done there's mathematical models that have been used to to scale this uh, this shark's bite force up. If our bite force is about 150 to 200 pounds, so that's great for biting carrots in half. But uh, the the but the the uh, uh, the record holder for uh, most powerful bite force for any uh, animal today is a saltwater crocodile, and that's at about 3,700 pounds of pressure uh, during a bite. But the megalodon has been calculated to have a bite force over 40,000 pounds. So that's wow. that's far beyond any uh, animal, even uh, the mathematical uh, model. Even T-Rex uh, doesn't even come close to that. Wow, that's amazing. So you wouldn't want to be in the mouth of a megalodon is what you're telling me. <laughs> it would be a short life. Uh, <laughs> that's think. amazing. And these teeth, tell us about these rotation of the teeth. What's happening here? Yeah, so what's really neat about these sharks, they're, because this is such an important part uh, for their survival, they have to have... You know they have to have these sharp tools on the end of their face, right? So that they can they can get that food. And these animals had huge uh, caloric requirements, right? So they had to eat a lot in order to maintain that big old body that they had. So, um, so when the, uh, the the teeth when they would uh, either be lodged in a, a a prey item or they eventually get dull and then they they rotate out kind of like a conveyor belt. And then that's why. Uh, fossil shark's teeth are some of the most common fossils uh, in the world. So they do really, one shark, I don't know what the, there's probably some great stat for that, but uh, one shark can produce uh, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of teeth in its lifetime. Um, and Megalodon was exactly the same way. So you can see in, in the sculpture that we made, there's three exposed rows of teeth, and there are at least uh, three more rows, uh, two to three more rows behind that. So the total Tooth count is about, of exposed teeth is about 138 teeth that we individually, my team and I made, uh, and that are visible in the in the model. That's amazing. That's amazing. And so here it is, right, uh, head on at the Smithsonian. What was it like to be uh, awarded that job at the Smithsonian? Was that just a, a dream come true? It's. I've been very lucky to do some previous projects for them, so. Um, it was great. It was. Uh, it's obviously an honor to have anything in, in in the National Museum of Natural History, and and this is such an iconic animal that it uh, it proved to be. It was an intimidating thing initially, you know, to think about like, okay, well, how are we going to really do this? You know, you get the commission and you have you've done all your homework, but still, it's you still have to make it. So it was. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of work. It's as I said. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of hours uh, by a lot of different people working in my shop uh, to help me make this thing come to life. That's incredible. All right, and here it is from below. What, uh, and, and why did you choose to make a female Megalodon for our viewers here uh, versus a male Megalodon? I just felt, uh, we talk, uh, talked about this, Hans Seuss was the scientist and um, he was fantastic to work with, by the way. Um, and he really kind of drove all of the aesthetic decisions, the, the science that, that drove the, the shape and, and look of it. And I want to give him a big shout out because he's just an amazing guy. Um, but 
but we decided to go with a female um, uh, just because it seemed aesthetically uh, a little bit more pleasing and uh, and also just uh, uh, just that it had a, a nicer flow to it to be honest nice nice well that is uh, an amazing story uh, I think we're going to go ahead and um, stop uh, our presentation and we're going to go ahead and take questions now um, from uh, our viewers. Excellent. Well, well, Mickey, Gary, thank you so much for that. What a fascinating presentation on so many different aspects of Megalodon, um, both in the past and now how we were able to recreate it in the present. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who's joined us for participating so actively in the text chat. Uh, one of the questions we've been getting is people are trying to conceptualize the size of this incredible creature, um, especially when compared to animals that exist presently on Earth. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how, for example, the Megalodon compares to the blue whale or something along those lines and then also how its teeth compare to something like a modern great white shark um, well sure so the blue whale as many of our viewers know is the largest animal to ever live on earth over a hundred feet long so megalodon fell into that range of around 60 feet long um, so it would have been smaller than a blue whale um, that's for certain um, with regards to um, its uh, difference between uh, a modern day uh, great white shark, this is a cast of a megalodon tooth here in my hand. You can see that pretty clearly. And then here is a modern day fossil of a white shark. So you can see the difference. And today it's estimated the maximum length of a great white shark is around 22 feet. Um, so 22 feet versus uh, 60 feet, you can see the difference right here in my hand. Wow, okay, so pretty significant difference. Um, Gary, there was lots of excitement in the text chat about that eye that you were showing us and talking about, and some people are wondering if you might be able to hold that up again and then also talk a little bit more about the materials you use to construct that. Sure, um, so we'll even get, we'll get it closer in. <laughs> so, yeah, so it it's actually takes forever to make these eyes, um, but it's, they're really important uh, because it's the first thing that we look at. So it's what we key on. And if you, when you walk into a room, would, what's the first thing you look at? You look at a person's eyes, right? So and it goes, the same goes for sculptures and you're gonna key in on the thing that breathes life or gives that animal life, hopefully. So I spend a lot of time uh, figuring out how to, do make, how to make the eyes and I do a lot of tests. And uh, this is one of the tests uh, from the Meg Megalodon. And so it, it starts with, a big block of plastic, basically. And I put it on a machine that spins it around and then I can use a, a sharp blade to, to, to mill out this external form. And then from that, I'll make a mold, a rubber mold. There's a lot of layers to it. Um, and then, I'll, then I will actually carve out the, the iris. So this colored, the, the part that holds the color and, and the pupil itself. Now, the interesting thing about Sharks now great. They're um, we're gonna go. I don't want to go into the weeds too far here, but um, but the but sharks are, are really interesting because some um, some sharks have nicotating membranes that will help protect their eyes. Now that was a big question with megalodon. Did it have that? Well, great great whites roll their eyes back into their head instead of having a membrane, and so we chose not. To, although they're not directly related. There's, that's one of those soft tissue issues that you, can, you just can't tell. Um, you, we don't know, and so that was, that was the choice for that. But yeah, it's a, so it's a hard plastic um, that is, the clear is made under pressure, so it's actually pressurized in a tank to make it optically clear. Wow, very, very cool. Thank you so much for that. Um, going back to a little bit about the biology of the megalodon, many of people are wondering about the life cycle and specifically how big a megalodon would have been when it was born and kind of what those pups were like, whether it gave live birth or laid eggs, maybe like some other modern sharks, if we could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so since um, like megalodons are in the laminate family, um, more than likely they were uh, live bearers, and so they gave birth to live young, and their young would have been quite large. Um, modern day great white shark uh, pups are around five feet long when they're born, so megalodons would have been um, much larger, and probably uh, a, a megalodon would have given birth to multiple 
um, sharks. Uh, great whites have anywhere from three to five pups um, during a reproductive cycle, and so probably similar to Megalodon. What's interesting is that they would have, uh, females would have probably done what they do now uh, with bull sharks, great whites, and others. They would move into shallow um, nursery areas with seagrass, um, a lot of food availability, and that's where they would pup uh, their babies. And what's also interesting is that many females will have a hormonal cascade that shuts down their desire to feed so that they don't end up eating their own offspring. And I know that sounds awful, but it's the way of the world. And so that was nature's way to ensure that females would give uh, birth in these areas and the sharks would be able to survive and thrive uh, and grow very quickly. And that was another thing that is so fascinating is in the fossil record, we see the growth of Megalodon just exploding. And we think that was parallel to its prey availability. And whales were growing big because there was a abundant krill and uh, plankton in the water. So it's a fascinating story. And you can just think endlessly about all the different possibilities um, of, these, of these different sharks. Wow, no kidding, what an amazing story. Um, Gary, a question for you. For a lot of our viewers, this is the first time they're hearing about paleo art as a field. And we have a lot of people who are wondering what inspired you to pursue this particular career path, and also if you have any favorite projects that you've worked on. Sure. Um, well, I've always just been an animal nut. And uh, so that's, that's the biggest, uh, that was the biggest driver in pursuing this. But I didn't even know it existed as a field. Uh, I, I'm a natural history artist, so I make, uh, and paleo artist, so I make models and sculptures of living animals and extinct animals, but primarily, I bet 75% of the work that I do is extinct animals. Um, and I, I had a really amazing experience when I was working at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I went out into the field for the first time, got to go on my first dig uh, with a guy, na a guy named Kirk Johnson. He's a good friend of mine now, but he, uh, it, it really changed my life and it made me think about, um, I mean, it was unavoidable to think, uh, to, to not think about the past in a new way. After you get out in the field, you really ask a lot more questions about the world and you think about past, you think about deep time, it forces you to think about deep time and the organisms that live there and how they interact with each other. And it just adds an incredible level of complexity to, to, to our story, because it is our story. Um, it's the story of, of the earth and where we are, are, we're tied into everything. And so that's, I can't, it's just such an amazing novel, right? So, so this is the, that was a, a really exciting epiphany for me. And I've just, I've been, you know, just head down in my pursuit of it uh, since then. And uh, some of my favorite projects, um, I've been lucky enough to work on a very wide diversity of things. So everything from reconstructing mummies um, to uh, life-size dinosaurs and of course uh, megalodon um, and tiny insects, you know, from fleas to life-size dinosaurs. So um, one of my favorite projects was uh, reconstructing the mummy of the Iceman for a museum in New York. That was a really cool uh, project because it involved going to Italy and going into the freezer and uh, actually gathering reference from the mummy itself. What an incredible experience. Like you said, just that ability to contemplate deep time. Um, thank you so much for that. I think everyone is very interested in this career um, and maybe how they can pursue it as well. Um, so going back a little bit to the biology of Megalodon, now on the other side of the life cycle, um, I know you talked a little bit about the, the natural predators maybe that the Megalodon had, um, but we have folks wondering a little bit more about, well, if the Megalodon was so big, how come it couldn't just adapt to things that might hunt it? What predators did it have? Um, so maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on uh, the end of the, the Megalodon's life cycle. Sure, you know, it, it's, it is truly a mystery. I mean, all of the things that we as scientists um, are trying to reconstruct are from the fossil record. And so there are a lot of gaps, but we use uh, what we know with extant species to try to understand um, the, the life history, the reproduction, um, the sensory biology of these animals. I mean, they had um, all the same senses that other sharks had most likely, and, and they were using all of those. Um, but I think the big story of the Megalodon is that it got so big 
um, so fast and then conditions changed. And when the conditions changed, whether that was cooling temperatures and they weren't able to perhaps follow as much prey as they had before, the abundance of prey in shallow, warm coastal areas um, went away where they were having their pups. There were probably a lot of factors that played into uh, the, the loss of Megalodon. And it's interesting because having that big body was advantageous at, what at one time for them. But as conditions changed, it was no longer advantageous. And to maintain that huge body, as Gary said, to eat that much food to maintain that body was very challenging. And as these other stealthier, smaller, quicker, perhaps, competitors came on the scene, um, it was probably a perfect storm of different things that led to uh, the decline and the, and the eventual extinction of the Megalodon. Wow, interesting. Thank you so much for that. Um, this is a, a question kind of for both of you. Um, we have a lot of people wondering about teeth and megalodon teeth. Uh, we saw kind of in that sculpture that you made that there's kind of this front row of teeth, but some of the other ones towards the back are, are bent. Um, and so we have folks asking why that happens. Um, if they have teeth that are similar to, for example, present day great white sharks with different layers. Um, and then also how many teeth a megalodon might have had and how we know that. So I'll turn it over to you both to talk about that. Sure. Um, well, in that in that model, the uh, the way we tried to portray it was that the teeth were sort of they get ratcheted out and then eventually fall off into the jaw when they get dull or or or, or broken during use. So that was the the way to try and um, to, to give a nod to modern shark biology uh, in in that respect. And so the of the teeth that are there, there's a there are actually two fairly complete uh, sets of teeth that have been found on Megalodon in situ together. So, and those show that in the top row, um, there's, uh, there were, uh, well, there's 72 exposed teeth in the top, 66 exposed teeth in the bottom. So the total is like 138 teeth uh, total exposed, but that doesn't include the other two layers that are getting the replacement layers behind it. Um, that are ready to ready to go and replace the the, the teeth as they wear out. I yeah, know. and you know what else is really fascinating in modern day sharks that we see. Um, so this is, for instance, the jaw of a sandbar shark, um, and you can see if I show you the business end on the inside, you can see just what Gary was talking about, the, that conveyor belts of teeth that are always constantly moving forward. And as you get to the corners, you see the teeth are, are smaller. So they're, they're coming in and they're growing. But what's fascinating to know is that the teeth um, of, of present day great white sharks, they change over time with the age of the shark. So in the beginning when these uh, great whites are juveniles, their teeth are very much needle-like like this. Um, and because they're eating fish and they're chasing small fish as they're little. As they get bigger and they grow bigger, um, their diet shifts and so do the shape of their teeth in their lifetime, which is incredible. So they become um, more like this, the, the triangular shape that we see um, in uh, adult great white sharks and that fits the diet of uh, seals, uh, marine mammals. And so just over a lifetime, you can see a shift in the shape of teeth um, within uh, an individual, which is truly amazing. And one cool thing is that they're very different where they are within the jaw as well. The shape is very different. So lower teeth are different than the top. Uh, the teeth that are closest to the midline of the shark are very different from the ones that are closest to the corners of the mouth. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Another question we've been getting, and I think this is um, a lot of people have heard of like the movie The Meg, or maybe they know about sharks from Jaws. Do these movies get anything right? If so, what? And, and how could they maybe portray um, megalodons and present day sharks more accurately? Oh boy. Well, you know, I have to say uh, my whole life is probably a result of Jaws because I saw that movie when I was a kid. So, and it, and it changed me. I love sharks because of that movie. And Meg was, I mean, it's so ridiculous. It's great. Um, it's entertaining. Um, you know, Sharknado, same thing. Um, do they get it right? Well, 
probably not. Um, but, but it, you know, it's maybe these movies should be taken for what they are, they're entertainment. And uh, they provoke uh, conversations and they provoke curiosity. And I think that's a good thing in some ways because it gets people to talk about uh, different shark species and start to ask questions about them. I don't know, Gary, what do you think? I, I think it's just, yeah, it is exactly it. I agree completely. You're, um, it's, it's a bit of entertainment. It's like Jurassic Park, right? So don't critique the dinosaurs, just enjoy the movie. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, and, and, and I think Meg's the same way. And, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. So, yeah, I think, I don't think you can, I don't think you can overevaluate that. They, a lot of the time the science goes, goes out the window. They'll start with the really, we're going to make the most accurate thing ever. But in the end, what they want is a good story and they want something that's visually arresting. And so they go for that. That's great. And like you said, fun is always good, especially if it inspires people to learn more. Um, excellent. So we've also, um, as people have kind of been asking about, for example, how we know uh, what their pups looked like or whether or not megalodons had migratory patterns, one question that's come up is, okay, these are, these are extinct, right? We can't observe um, contemporary megalodon life patterns. So how do we know, for example, where they might have lived, what they ate, where they had their pups, where they cycled to? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll let you, Gary, chime in too, but I, I feel like it's really in the fossil record. We find megalodon teeth in certain areas. We find uh, the record of uh, juvenile uh, megalodon as well. That's why we've learned a little bit about um, their distribution and perhaps where they were at certain times in our past. Um, but the inferences that we make um, about their reproductive biology and all of that is, is just based on extant species, species living today um, that are that are closely related. And that's really the, the, the best way for us to put the puzzle pieces together and to try to guess, uh, you know, give it our best uh, estimate because we just don't have that information readily available. So we have to um, use all the tools that we have to really help us reconstruct our best effort. And it's an ongoing process. Like we haven't figured it all out. We're still learning. And there are scientists who have dedicated their lives to understanding the biology and the ecology and the sensory systems of these ancient fish. And how, what an amazing uh, job. And, and Gary, I'm sure you can add to that. No, I, I, I think it's really important to remember that even within our understanding of modern biology, there's a lot of life stories in life uh, that we don't understand in, of animals um, because they are either cryptic, you know, they're animals that are hard to study, um, or we just don't have enough time and money to study these animals. So it's, you're, you're working with what you have, which are the fossils, and you're working at the distribution of those fossils. And that's really the only thing you can, can use for, to gain the information and tell a story. So that's, uh, it's, it's hard, but there are, as our tools get more powerful, um, you know, the tools to, to look back into time, and I mean that by studying the fossils and studying the geology that the fossils are in, then you can, you can tell a better story. Fantastic. And I love that idea of kind of constructing the story of the past and solving these mysteries. That's great. Um, Gary, someone's wondering how um, you might have constructed Megalodon differently or what decisions you might have made if you weren't necessarily taking aesthetic into account. You know, you talked about the female Megalodon was a little bit more aesthetic. What are some different decisions you might have made um, if it wasn't to be hanging in this great hall? Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with... Uh, what we it's it's a negotiation right so when you enter in with a scientist and um you both have this mutual love for the subject and so that's it's always really fun but it can be challenging because we're, we're we are primates with our own individual ideas about what how things should be right so uh i, I but i'm i wouldn't i i love to we push trying to get a nice a nice um flow to the animal and so it has movement and it has life and in that position I don't know there's not many buildings that are big enough to actually hold that animal uh, so I actually I'm fairly happy with the way uh, it flows I don't know if I would other than some radical way of uh, presenting it differently um, uh, I, I you know it would be fun to play with color variations that's always great and easy to do that would be a neat neat way to think about it differently. Uh, maybe something with more pattern even, um, but those are, those are subtle. I think, I don't think the, the physical shape of it would change very much because we would get so much work 
trying to arrive at those proportions. I think that the thing would look very much the same, um, but there would any of the differences might be just in pose and color. Awesome. All right. Great. Um, well, one question people are wondering about, there's this great picture that we showed on um, both in the slideshow and then also that was on social media of a megalodon in very shallow water um, hunting an animal. People are wondering, could megalodons actually go into that shallow of water in order to find prey? Um, well, I can take a stab at that. I, I think uh, you're talking about uh, what looked like almost a mammoth, a uh, platybelodon, and that was uh, uh, an illustration by Julius, who is uh, an amazing uh, paleo artist, and he allowed us to use those uh, illustrations today. So a shout out to him. Thank you very much. Um, I think they did. Um, I don't know if they hunted in shallow waters, um, but they certainly probably went into shallow waters to have their, their pups. Um, that was definitely a strategy that they likely employed, um, just because, again, we see that with female sharks today um, that are live bearers. And so that's a strategy that's pretty much across the board. Um, however, uh, I don't know if they hunted in shallow waters like that. Um, I think they were more ambush predators, and so they likely, uh, you know, were in deeper waters, uh, ambushing from below their unsuspecting prey, like uh, uh, Pisco Bellina, the whale that you saw earlier. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Gary, you have an amazing studio behind you there. We have some folks wondering uh, what's behind you, that big shark there, and maybe if you have any other interesting things that we've been looking at, if you could tell us a little bit about those. <laughs> um, so this is, the, this is the small scale model uh, that we uh, based, uh, that I created, and then we used this as a planning model to create the full scale Megalodon. And you can see it has a grid pattern on it and everything is numbered. And that's how uh, I broke it into sections so that we could uh, plan. And then we built scale, you know, a small scale truck and we built a small scale door um, so that we could practice uh, getting uh, the pieces physically through and into the shape because they're all compound curves. And it becomes difficult to, uh, to try and visualize that just with, with measurements. But I, I have a lot of, I've worked on a bunch of, there's some Paleozoic shark uh, material up here, World 2 Shark, my artist friend, um, and and uh, just an inspiration, Ray Troll turned me on to this, this crazy world tooth shark. And, and so there's a sculpture that I did for him of that. Um, and a lot of things, I, I do a lot of comparative work. So because I work on such a wide variety of things, um, I have to be able to look at um, everything from, you know, the itty bitty earliest mammals to uh, the largest dinosaurs to some of the, weirdest invertebrates that have ever lived to um to us you know so it's we've got I've, everything here is sort of a, a byproduct of previous projects and my personal interest in making stuff like i just make a lot of things so that's the that's the reason and this you i could walk for about 80 feet and it wouldn't look much different than this it just keeps going so and we're going to start a museum here locally in Kearney. Uh, this is my dream. So uh, eventually a lot of these things will come to rest in that museum. Fantastic, wow. Oh my goodness, that's so cool. Hopefully we'll all get a chance to see that one day. Um, this is for either of you. People are wondering um, how many fossils of the Megalodon have we found um, and where primarily have we found those fossils? So really how much information are we working with here? So in, uh, the, there are literally thousands of megalodon teeth that have been found, uh, but those, those are all isolated teeth for the most part. There are two situations, one in Peru, uh, where they have a jaw set, and then uh, in Florida, there's a, there's a collector who has one of the most complete uh, assemblies of teeth, uh, and that's in a private collection. Hopefully, eventually, that will make its, make its way to a museum. Um, but those are the two best uh, fossils of, the, of a, a, a complete jaw uh, arrangement of teeth. The, the, the discs that are preserved are very rare. The, the, the backbone, uh, they're called centrum. They look like little dinner plates. Um, those are, are found, but they're usually disassociated. So like a lot of animals that are in the ocean, when they die, of course, other animals will take them apart and, and spread their their skeleton apart. So that I think that was probably pretty, pretty.
pretty common uh, thing, and that's why the, the the fossils are distributed pretty widely, um, just physically. But anyway, geologically, that's a different story. They're they're like uh, Mickey said, they're all over the world, um, and I don't know as far as hot hotbeds. Florida is an amazing place to find megalodon teeth. Uh, you can find those. You can dive for megalodon teeth in Florida. You can, and I and I and I actually got to see that private collection. That's Gordon Hubble's, and uh, it was absolutely astounding to stand there and see that reconstruction um, in his uh, own personal collection. It's amazing, and you can go to certain areas in in the Carolinas and in Florida, and megalodon teeth are are fairly common. It's amazing um, to think about, and there are certain areas where they're just they just keep coming up and coming up. But people find them on the beach. People find them when they're diving in the Carolinas. Um, so there are certain areas where, for whatever reason, they've preserved very well, and there are quite a few of them. Excellent. All right, we're just going to do two more questions. Um, this first one, uh, people are wondering, um, are all modern sharks genetically related to megalodon or just some of them? And kind of related to that, maybe you can elaborate, you've already mentioned this somewhat, but how does it really help modern shark biologists to study the megalodon to understand more about contemporary sharks? Yeah, well, I mean, we are all, you know, closely related. We all share our, you know, ancient um, and common ancestors. So, I mean, in truth, yes. Um, and what's interesting is there's eight living orders of sharks, and they're all different, uh, grouped together by different characteristics and their genetics. Um, so, you know, megalodons are related to all sharks. They're, they're part of that history and that past. Um, part of the tree. But it's interesting, you know, uh, to, to think about why do we study things from the past? And I think it's, you know, the, the fate of megalodon as a species is no different than many other species. We might only have a certain timeline on planet Earth and conditions might change so much so that, you know, animals do not uh, survive. They go extinct. Ex extinction is real. It's forever. And every species faces that fate. Um, at one time or another for one reason or another. So studying things in the past is incredibly important, I feel, to give us clues about what might happen in the future, to give us predictive tools um, so that we might not, so we might be able to understand uh, things in our potential future. It's a, it's a great tool. And I think it's also personally gratifying. Um, I'm curious, I wanna know. I love looking at the rocks and trying to understand what was alive before us. If I could only have a time machine, I would go back in time to see dinosaurs and megalodons. It would be incredible. I'm sure, Gary, you feel the same. <laughs> oh, no, the same. I, I, every day I live in the past, so uh, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. So yeah, no, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, deep time and trying to figure out you know, how is it the really complex relationships between animals and ecosystems. And uh, that's a fun way to look at the world. Absolutely. Well, um, our last question, you know, we have here a paleo artist and a shark biologist. And we've also got a lot of young people in the room who are wondering, maybe first of all, what's your favorite part of your job? And then what's one step they might be able to take um, even today to kind of work towards potentially following in your footsteps? Shark biologist? <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I have a dream job. I have the dream, the, the job I always wanted to have. I get to think about sharks all day long and share their true story with people all over the world. Um, I can't think of a more amazing thing. And I get to spend time underwater with them, swimming next to them, looking into their eyes, imagining, you know, what it would be like to be swimming in that ocean, you know, 10 million years ago, looking into the eyes of, of very different sharks. Um, it's a dream, and it's something that I take very uh, seriously because studying the natural world, to me, is the most fundamental thing we could do. It's the most important thing we could do to understand our place in it and to understand the co-inhabitants of planet Earth um, right alongside us and to give them a voice and to have empathy and to share that with young people who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow is, to me, the most important thing that I can do, and I hope that uh, young people are inspired to think that there is tremendous value in nature um, because I think there is. Well said. Uh, if you want to become a paleo artist, the best thing you can do is to just start making things. So uh, making, uh, get your hands on a bunch of clay, get your hands on some pencils, some paper, 
and don't stop making. That is the, the best way to learn, but then also um, be an observer, right? An observer in life. So observe life, observe animals, observe people, uh, and figure out how they work. Um, that's, the, that's the best way to, if you're gonna try and be a paleo artist and you're replicating life forms, is to understand living forms. So you have to look at, look at what's around you, pull that information into your file folder of your brain and use that information to pour out of your hand into a pencil as you replicate images of past life or sculpt clay to, uh, to look uh, to create a visage of, of an ancient beast. So that's the, you just have to make and observe and just do it maniacally and don't stop and then you, it'll work, it'll happen. Fantastic. Well, this has been so informative and most of all inspiring. Thank you both for taking the time with us today. Um, for everyone who joined us, thank you for being here from all over the country and the world. Um, if you want to share this with people or look back on some of what you learned today, there will be a recording of the presentation available both on YouTube and on our Facebook page later today. Um, if you registered for this webinar with your email address here in Zoom, we're also going to be sending out um, a fact sheet and a series of activities activities that you can do to keep learning more about Megalodon and even try your hand at a little bit of shark biology. Um, I also wanted to let everyone know that we'll be doing a live stream tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, you can register for that on our website, oceanfirstinstitute.org, and Mickey and I will be talking about ways that you can help the ocean, even if you live inland, like in Boulder, Colorado, which we both do. Um, and finally, we also have a resource page on our website where you can have more information about the Megalodon, as well as um, upcoming information about other live streams, and some fun at-home ocean science activities and resources there so please feel free to visit that um, and I will turn it over now to Gary and Mickey for any final thoughts before we wrap up thank you all yeah uh, well I would just like to um, say thank you all for tuning in to learn more about the Megalodon I hope you learned a lot today I hope you're inspired to care about sharks and to uh, want to learn more about the natural world and um, I would just like to give a big thank you to Gary um, I'm so excited to um, have met you and to learn about all of your work. It's been uh, just an incredible journey to get to know you and to get to know all of the things that you're doing and to understand your passion. Um, it's been a true treasure. So um, thank you, Gary. Oh, my, my pleasure. And please support, support Ocean First. So these people are doing amazing work and uh, pay attention to what they're doing and help them in any way that you can. So that's, that's what, I mean, this is, this is important stuff. And, and you need, we need to be active participants in the world we live in, and this is a great way to do it. So please support Ocean First. All right, well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, we appreciate it. Be on the lookout for some Megalodon resources so you can dive in a little bit deeper and learn even more about Megalodon. So thank you all so much for tuning in today, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye, thanks again, Gary.